Do creationists believe in natural selection? When people say they've observed evolution happening, what have they really seen? Stay tuned to find the answers. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live, the program that gives you answers to tough questions about science and the Bible. Uh, questions like, you know, how would Noah get all the animals on board the ark? Or where did dinosaurs fit in the Bible? And are these really important questions that people should be asking anyway? Many other questions. Things like, how could uh, all the Earth's population come from two people? Mm -hmm. Only two people. Right. Today we'll be examining the foundations of biological evolution. You know, Charles Darwin, when he wrote his famous book in 1859 on the origin of species, right. he said that natural selection, he said natural selection is the driving force behind evolution. That's the mechanism that he talked about as evolving one kind of an animal into a different kind of an animal. Mm -hmm. However, Edwin Blythe, who was a creationist, had written about the concept of natural selection 24 years. He'd, he'd published on it 24 years before uh, Darwin's book came out. So the concept of natural selection uh, was something people knew about uh, before Darwin. That's right. A lot of people wrote on natural selection. Benjamin Franklin wrote on natural selection. Right. Uh, what's interesting about Edward Blythe is he wrote about it in a creationist context. Right. Right. And that's what makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. um, natural selection has always been an important part of the creation model. Right. Uh, right from the days of Edward Blythe, and of course it's used today as well, to answer questions like, how could Noah fit all those animals on the ark? Did he need to take one of every kind of species that's out there? Right. He didn't, right. because they diversified through natural selection after the flood. So Christians, um, uh, many, many times they're surprised when we talk about natural selection in our talks and talk about it in Creation Magazine, but... That's right. See, both evolutionists and creationists observe animals changing, right. little changes within a kind. We observe that. In fact, we could say that there's not a single observation that we make as creationists that, or, or, or that evolutionists make that we would disagree with. Right. We observe animals changing. We observe, observe light coming from stars that are millions of light years away. Right. We agree with evolutionists in this area, and we'll show you why. Many people believe that carbon dating has proven the biblical timeline is not scientifically valid. It supposedly dates some material beyond 6,000 years. Because the theory of evolution requires millions of years to be viable, a young Earth position is in direct opposition to that theory. However, in many cases, carbon dating has not assisted evolutionists in the attempt to prove the theory of evolution. Take coal, for example. If, in fact, it is millions of years old, it should have no traces of carbon-14 in it. However, scientists to date have not yet found any coal completely lacking all carbon-14. While this may baffle many scientists, it makes perfect sense to creation scientists who believe that the Earth is relatively young. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. CreationOnTheWeb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, 
we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. The term apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, meaning defense. It refers to the type of defense given in a court of law. Christian apologetics is the reasoned defense of the Christian faith against objections. The Apostle Paul said, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 Christians today need to study apologetics as we love the Lord with our mind as well as our heart. Well, as we get started here, and we're talking about natural selection today and whether that's evidence of creation or evolution, the, uh, the two uh, explanations for how we got here, um, we should probably define some terms and, and define ways in uh, perhaps um, creationists might have been um, portrayed and uh, maybe evolutionists have, uh, have been uh, portrayed right. and, and when, yeah. we're, when we're talking about the subject. So I know when you go to the Natural History Museum in London, um, you, you, you can go and there's interpretive plaques there and you can, you can take a look at it and it talks a lot about natural selection, talks a lot about Darwin and, and so on and so forth. And uh, if, if you look at the plaques, they sort of start steering you down in a, a trail of thought that might not be as accurate as you and I would, would agree okay. with. Okay, so well, I'm, I'm just going to. Well, <laughs> let, let's take a look at these, some of the plaques. That if, if you went there looking at evolution, it said, uh, Darwin's work supported the view that all living things have developed into the forms we see today by a process of gradual change over a very long period of time. And it says this is what's meant by evolution. And then it says many people find that the theory of evolution does not conflict with their religious beliefs. Okay. So already yeah. <laughs> they've given you a little caveat there that says, well, you know, you, you, can, you can marry the idea of evolution into your religious beliefs. That's not going not to be a problem. And then another plaque says, before Charles Darwin, most people believe that God created all living things in exactly the form that we see them today. And it says this is the basis of the doctrine of creation. Okay, and that is certainly not what we, what we believe. Right, and it's not what the Bible states either. The Bible doesn't state that God created everything in exactly the form that we see them today. I mean, people use this as an argument against the Bible. They say, well, you know, the Bible says God created everything, you know, the way it is. And we see things changing, so therefore the Bible's wrong. But when you actually go and read Genesis, it says, you know, ten times that God created specific types of animals and plants to reproduce after their own kind, which is exactly what we see. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and so the, really the, the central question, uh, we, we need to go on defining our terms, but the central question here is which of those two histories better describes what we see in genetics and when we see animals changing and so on. Right, but I just like to point that out because uh, many people would just read something like that and say, oh, okay, well, see, there's evidence against what the Bible says, but they haven't really checked closely what the Bible says. Right. And, uh, and so we have to go on from there. If, if we were to believe what the, what the plaque there at the, uh, at the London Natural History Museum says, um, that, that God produced everything in exactly the form we see today, would, that would make God responsible for some uh, uh, life forms that are not that good. Uh, for example, in, well, I'm, I'm, it's kind of funny, but I mean, if you think of the dog kind, you can right. think of dogs that are kind of at a genetic dead end. Right. And, and we often make fun of the poor poodle. Right. Uh, and we just use that as an example of a dog that has, has been bred to such an extent where a right. lot of the genetic, uh, the robustness within the, the, all that genetic information has been culled out over time right. and you wind up with something like a poodle or a collie or a bulldog. Right, because we call them purebreds, but you should call them inbreds. And we know what happens with inbreds <laughs> after a while. You get a lot of mistakes a lot of and, problems. and problems. But yeah. we could think of other, we could think of like the bear kind. We don't need to talk about dogs. We can think about bears. In, in, if we think about the bear kind, there's all kinds of different types of bears. Right. God created unique kinds to begin with. Mm -hmm. And today we have all kinds of variety within the bear kind. Right. But the panda is like the bear version of the poodle. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the panda is at a, at a kind of a genetic dead end. It only right. eats bamboo. It can only eat bamboo. If you don't give it bamboo, it'll die. It's, right. it, it's not capable of, of uh, this robustness in its life. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and these, these other types of, if we go back and think about dogs, of course dogs change. Right. 
into different dogs. There's they were variability men there. Kind. Where did that variability come from is really one, one of the things we want to talk about. See, as we're defining terms, um, you know, we talked about, I believe, in the, in the episode one that, um, you know, there's different types of science. So if we're going to observe evolution, you know, you refer to the fact when people say they've observed evolution happening, what have they observed? And, and of course, if we're going to try to prove a theory or prove a hypothesis, then uh, by the scientific method, we would have to have a method of investigation um, involving observation. Like, you'd have to be able to see it. So if I want to test the theory of gravity, I can set up an experiment, we can repeat it, I can show it in the present, I can observe it happening, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So really, we're going to be talking about whether we can observe evolution uh, not just observe natural selection because we'd agree that natural selection does occur. So when we talk about natural selection and evolution, a lot of Christians think, well, aren't you talking about the same thing? Right. They Isn't equate, natural selection the same thing as evolution? Right. They equate natural selection to be evolution. But um, here's a definition of evolution. The general theory of evolution was defined by the evolutionist Kirkut as the theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. So what he's saying is, to put it simply, um, there was a simple life form that just happened to spontaneously generate. And that simple life form would have a limited amount of genetic information. So if we put it into an analogy, let's say, of a book of information, the right. DNA that would code for that simple life form would, would, let's say, be one book full of information. But if we take something like a horse, uh, it would have a tremendously more amount tremendous more amount of information so well, let's say there's 10 books of genetic information to, for, that would code for the horse so the question is where does the new genetic information come from right if you're gonna change a lizard or lizard like creature into a bird where does the new information for wings and feathers and aero, aerodynamic structures and all that stuff come from so the, yeah evolution the, the way the story goes, uh, which, yeah. which we don't believe, yeah. but the way the story goes is, is exactly as this fellow here uh, defined it. All life came from a single cell, and right. that, as you already said, that would require an information gaining process to go from something like a single cell to a, uh, right. to a lizard or to a horse or something. Single cells obviously don't have information for, for hair and hooves and, and, and the other right. things we find in so, horses. So it would have to be a creative process. Evolution would have to be a creative process, creating new information. And um, you know, is that the type of change we see? When we look at natural selection, really that's, that's one of the things this we're going to be talking This about. is the key issue. It all boils down to the genetic information. Right. It, and, and an understanding of this issue really needs to get to that level of science, right. the genetics. Is new information being generated? That's what evolutionists have to come up with. Right. They have to have a mechanism that generates new, never before existing genetic information right. that can build all these bigger and better structures. Right. That, uh, that supposedly never existed before. Right. right. Never before existing information, right. in, in, back when, the, when there was only a single cell that gave rise to all the diversity of life. There wasn't information right. for skin and hair and heart and a brain and so on. Right. So you have to generate it somehow, according to evolution. Right. Now, Dr. Werner Gitt is an information specialist. Since we're talking about information, mm -hmm. We'll go to an information specialist. He okay. wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information that you and I both, uh, both love. Mm -hmm. um, and in his book, he says this, a code system is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. Mm -hmm. It should be emphasized that matter as such is unable to, to generate any code. All experiences indicate that a thinking being voluntarily exercising his own free will, cognition, and creativity is required. Right. He goes on to say, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Right. Now, do you realize what a serious problem that is for the evolutionist? It's a tremendously serious problem. Here's yes. an information specialist yeah. saying that information never comes from naturalistic processes. It right. always requires intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's and a great it, time to be a Christian. It, it, it's true yeah. because when you, know, you think of any code, any type of code, which information is probably, that's probably one of the better ways to define information is a code. If you see a code system, like right. we're speaking a code system right now, that's so how people are understanding us, hopefully. And, or if you're reading or something, it, it's a code. So we know that the DNA is actually a code. They call it the genetic code, not just because it, it, it's a good analogy. We know it's a code system. And so you know, if I were to take a piece of chalk and write my name on, the, on a chalkboard, it's not because of the chalk, the material, that there's 
there's the information from my name, Calvin, there. It's, it's because of my mind adding, the, you know, because of the arrangement of the parts there. There's no information in chalk. You can have chalk, the white cliffs of Dover. There's, there's not a lot of information <laughs> there. But if right. an intelligent mind, and that's, that's what uh, Dr. Git is, is discussing and there. And he talks about in his book, there's different levels of information, how we understand information, and the same thing is happening in the DNA. Right. Uh, you think about uh, the language that is there in the DNA, written chemically, right. but that language needs to be common within the cell in order for the, the structure of the chemical letters on the DNA to mean anything. Right. You have to be, have a translation device in there that can understand it, just like the people listening to us right now can understand it because they, they've got a translator. But only so, if they know English. Exactly. But if they don't know English, then we're communicating sounds, but it's not any information. Right. When we come back, we're going to look at examples of animals changing over time due to natural selection and see if it supports creation or evolution. Belief in evolution has prompted a search for missing links to bolster the idea that man has evolved from ape-like creatures. This has led to some colossal scientific errors, one of which was Nebraska man. Evidence found in 1922 was proclaimed to belong to the first man-like ape of America. The Illustrated London News printed a picture of the ape man, showing the shape of his body, head, nose, ears, the amount of hair he had, his wife, domestic animals, and tools. And what was the evidence for the illustration? A single tooth. And not just any tooth, but the tooth of a pig. When Dr. Carl Whelan started Creation Magazine in his home in 1978, little did he realize that today it would reach into some 140 countries all around the world and have such a huge impact in so many lives. This unique 56-page, full-color family magazine refutes evolution and gives God the glory for the amazing creation we see all around us. It gives you the answer to defend your faith and uphold the true history of the world found in Genesis. Creation Magazine is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page in Creation Magazine is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure that the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. The exciting articles also provide great witnessing material that you won't find anywhere else. Many have come to faith in Christ because of subscribers sharing this magazine with them. So subscribing not only boosts your faith, it enables you to get biblical truth into your community in a special way. Subscribe today and have it delivered to your home every three months. Visit www.creationontheweb.com for subscription information or call the CMI office nearest you. We're talking about natural selection. If we use dogs as an example, um, dogs we know initially came from a wolf-like ancestor. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there, and this is this is not something that creationists are saying. Evolutionists right. uh, uh, agree with this, and yet today we have a, a huge variety within the dog kind. Right. Yeah. There's there was an article in uh, um, Science magazine in November 2002. It said genetic evidence for an East Asian origin of domestic dogs. I'll just read you what it says. It says the origin of the the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We examined the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 domestic dogs representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. So they're, they're admitting that they've, they've examined the evidence and they know they can, everything you see today, poodles, Great Danes, Chihuahuas, <laughs> all the variety of dogs. Of course, we know because of the breeding experiments we've done in the last 100 years, we, we can create a lot of different variations or you know, what they call species of dogs, but they say that they can trace them all back to, um, to wolves. So how do we get, that's the question, right. how do we get all these different varieties of dogs? 
Right. Um, evolution theory might postulate that you, you need to generate all this genetic information for all these different types of dogs. You've right. got Dalmatians that have white fur and black spots and so on, then you've got large dogs and small dogs, and you've got to generate all this information right. where the Bible suggests that God created individual kinds of animals to begin with, so within the dog kind, right. he would have put the genetic information there to begin with, that fits exactly what we, with right. what we know about information theory. It takes intelligence to get information, Dr. Git was saying. Right. And uh, so he put the information there to begin with, uh, the infinitely intelligent creator God, and that's been diversifying ever since mm -hmm. through natural or artificial selection with these domestic dogs. Right. So if we, think of, uh, if, we, if we think of biblical history, take the example of Noah's flood. Okay. And two of the dog kind would have got on board the ark, Right. And they would have got off the ark after the flood. So now you've got two dogs living on the earth, and they get married and have kids, and they get married and have kids, and so on. And, right. and uh, it's a Christian program, so we need to dress it up a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, but each one of those pups is a little bit different than mom and dad. Mm -hmm. the, the, the genes have combined in different ways. Right. Now, in some of those pups, they've lost some information. And, and this is the way it works. The, the, the genetic recombination, you don't get all the information from, from mom and dad dog, all of that information right. in one of the pups. You, you get a mixture of that information. Mm -hmm. They're still the offspring of those parents, but they're a little bit different than mom and dad. And right. we, we could relate this to people, uh, people with different characteristics yeah. and so on. And, and we're just talking about dogs uh, just because we're familiar with them and so on. And there's so many varieties. And we know that they came from a, from right. a single wolf-like kind. I mean, I got to become a grandpa last year, which was pretty cool. And when my... You're how old? Are, you're 38? No, I'm 40 and, now. And you're a grandpa. I'm 40 yeah. and I'm a grandpa, yeah. How I got married young. My, my oldest daughter got married young. But, you know, when, when <laughs> little Eliana came along, one of the first things, and of course we did it with our kids, is you're looking at the baby and you're going, oh, look, she's got mommy's eyes oh, and right, daddy's yeah. ears. Yeah. And Because everybody knows the in, where the information came from. It's not a big mystery. You know that the information got passed on from mom and dad. But she didn't, you know, she got certain information for certain traits from mom and certain information from certain traits from dad. It wasn't spontaneously uh, right, generated right. information. So going back to the dogs, we yep. now have a population after the flood of a, a variety within the dog kind through genetic uh, recombinations, uh, mother and father to offspring and so on, right. to these, these pups. Now imagine that we get to the point of the Tower of Babel. And the people scattering away from Babel, let's say they take some dogs with them mm -hmm. to different climate areas in the, in, o over the world. Right. So from the Middle East, let's say some move north into Europe and England and so on, where it's colder. And they have a variety of, uh, of dogs there. Some have long fur, some have short fur, and so on. Right. After a while, in that climate area, the dogs that are better adapted, we would think the dogs with long fur, so the dogs with the genetic information for long fur, produce long fur, right. they would perhaps be more healthy, leave more offspring, and so on. After a while, in that area of the world, in that climate area, right. all you have within that dog population is the genetic information for long fur. So you get dogs, let's say, move into an area. Let's say it's, it's warmer. Let's say it's the summertime. But then the winter comes. So you've got long-haired dogs. They can survive. The medium-furred ones perhaps leave, and the short ones, if they don't leave, they die. That's right. So you end up with just the ones with information for long hair. Right. right. You've, you've now, in that population, that population has now become adapted to their environment through natural selection. Right. That's natural selection. Right. That's, now, now this, is, this is a very simple way of talking about it. It's much more complex than this, but right. these are the basic things that we're talking about on Creation Magazine Live. It's, yeah. it's the same thing that Creation Magazine does. Yeah. We take these scientific concepts, our scientists do that, and we try to explain these things at right. a layman's level. Accurately, but so that people can understand But still them. understandable. Because a lot of times when this <laughs> stuff is talked about, there, there seems to be so much jargon or so much, you know, um, maybe perhaps uh, leading you towards a certain conclusion uh, rather than just looking at the evidence. I mean, really what you're talking about is, okay, if these dogs with long hair uh, keep, keep breeding, then you're just going to see long-haired dogs. It's kind of like my wife uh, and I. I've got blonde hair, blue eyes. She's got blonde hair, blue eyes. Guess what my kids have? Blonde hair, blue eyes. Because we only have that information. So until, you know, my son-in-law, you know, the rogue, came and stole my daughter's heart, 
No, I'm just joking. He's a really nice guy. Until he came along, <laughs> okay. and uh, and uh, you know he's got you know darker hair, darker eyes. So I'm going to see some variation in my my grandkids now. Well, hopefully, Ellie and right. she's But I mean, there's there's too. recessive genes and all. Kids. Right. It's much more complicated right. than we're saying. But the point here is, yeah. is that going back to the dog example again, in that colder climate, yeah. you've now lost the information to produce short fur. Right. So when you use terms like adaptation, when I was growing up, I used to think that. You know, somehow they were like gaining new information and they adapted to their environment, but the information was that's already not, there. That's not what's going on. Right. The information was there and they've actually lost some genetic information. Evolution requires the gaining of massive amounts of new genetic information, as we've already said. Right. Natural selection is not evolution. Mm -hmm. So you've got all this information, you can divvy it up different ways, there so before you see variation. I mean, they've estimated that there's 10 to the 80th power. Uh, atoms in the known universe, but geneticists have said that there's 10 to the 2017th uh, amount of variation that if, if a man and a woman, uh, any man and any woman on the on the planet today, could keep producing offspring, um, that'd be scary for the lady. But um, <laughs> if they could, could, could keep doing that, it would take 10 to the 2017th power uh, before you'd get an exact duplicate. There's, I mean, there's that much variability right. between the, 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 the or possible recombinations of the genetic that's, information. That's correct. Huge yeah. amount of information in right. the genes, and that refers to people. But yeah. uh, um, we, we've used dogs and fur length as an example. We could think of other examples of of natural selection as well. Or, or, uh, as, as natural as we can think of, we can right. think of mosquitoes and DDT, d mosquitoes right. and pesticide. This would many viewers would be familiar with this. Right. Uh, DDT was sprayed, uh, uh, and, and this was a studied example. Mm -hmm. It wipes out 99.9 .9 whatever of, of of the mosquito population, right. and those that already have the resistance go on to repopulate the mosquitoes. And now, because they whatever. Their, their variation was, right. they've got that ability to overcome the pesticide, they repopulate the species, you've, you've now got an entire species right. of, uh, entire group of mosquitoes that are resistant to the DDT. But it's not, and the newspapers write this up as evidence for evolution. Right. We see evolution happening all around us, it's happening everywhere. Right. How come you creationists can't see this? We see it, but when you look at it at the level of information in the genes, right. it's not evolution. Right. There's no information being gained. I, I always wondered why you know you use that uh, sanitary you know that hand hand, oh, the hand sanitizer. And, and, you know yeah, it says 99.9 yeah. percent .9 of the germs killed. I thought, well, why doesn't it kill 100? Because it seems as if that there is a portion of that population that you can't kill with that particular. It has um, a resistance to the hand sanitizer. Right. It's as, the same the same example. As a matter of fact, when they you know there's been several expeditions up to the Arctic and stuff, and sometimes they recover the bodies of people that were lost and, and, and died up there, and they revive some of the bacteria. They'll test the bacteria of someone that died a hundred years ago, let's say, and and they'll they'll test it with pesticide or or bacterial uh, agents. Um, that, that were created after that person died, and the bacteria will be resistant to it. They're already resistant. They're so already they had the resistance already. Right. That's it the point. It couldn't have evolved it because they were created after, so it already had the resistance. Nothing new built is in. being generated, and really, that's the main point. When we look at animals right. changing over time, and they do, right? And we agree with that. Yeah, yeah. And, and evolution has observed that. The, the, the difficulty is they're saying that that's evidence for evolution, right? If, if, if we observe these little changes, imagine if you had millions of years, you could get big changes. But you can't, because they're not adding new features. They're not adding new genetic information to build bigger and better structures. Right. And really, that is the main point with biology and evolution and natural selection. It supports the Bible and doesn't support evolution. People believe that aliens from distant planets may hold the key to understanding the mysteries of life. However, belief in life in outer space is rooted in belief in the theory of evolution. A popular pro-ET website says, over the last half century, scientists have developed a theory of cosmic evolution that predicts that life is a natural phenomenon likely to develop on planets with suitable environmental conditions. In other words, if it happened here, it must have happened elsewhere. But repeatable science shows evolution didn't happen here. There is a message from a higher intelligence that tells us the real solution to life's mysteries. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life.
Refuting Evolution is a hard-hitting, point-by-point refutation of today's arguments for evolution. Written especially for students from high school to university, it's one of the most powerful summaries of the arguments against evolution and for creation. Author Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, a PhD chemist with Creation Ministries International Australia, systematically unravels evolutionary claims in the key areas of the debate. He starts by showing the starting biases held by both creationists and evolutionists, and how it guides their interpretation of the facts they examine. From there he moves on to cover topics like variation and natural selection, missing links, ape men, the Big Bang, the age of the Earth, and more. Dr. Sarfati swiftly debunks many of the grand claims made by modern evolutionary theory while simultaneously showing that scientific models proposed by biblical creationists provide a better explanation of the world around us. One of the most popular creationist books of all time, this top-selling book will help stimulate much discussion among students, teachers, and anyone interested in understanding the science behind the origins debate. We're back, and this is in the, in the news section. We always like to talk about, uh, you know, some of the the, the newspaper reports and uh, the you know, latest science or what's going on. Right, and, and uh, it doesn't seem hard to. You don't have to go very far uh, checking out the news reports before you come across something that seems to have something to do with evolution. It's highly promoted in the news. Yes, yeah. For for this week, we've chosen an article that was actually discussed in Creation Magazine called "Too Dry for a Fly," and I'll just read some excerpts right out of Creation Magazine. This article in Creation Magazine. And it concerns the, adapt, the, the, the adaptability of a fly in rainforests that are, that are used to hot and humid conditions. Okay. The rainforest fly, and this is the technical word, Dropsophilia birchii, <laughs> lives in, not surprisingly, rainforests, where the air is humid and everything is nice and moist. So scientists, uh, the, the Australian rainforest where this, this, uh, this paper was written on, uh, it's becoming fragmented and so on, and there are portions of it that are getting drier, apparently. Right. And so, so scientists decided to test this fly in the laboratory to see how quickly the rainforest fly would be able to adapt to a drier environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, they've d they did this over 50 fly generations, and uh, since flies can reproduce so quickly, it doesn't take a lot of time. Right. And then the article goes on, the astonished researchers thought something must be wrong because they took these, after 50 generations, they took whatever was left over, like they, they, they took these flies and, yeah. and dried out their environment and then took the survivors right. and bred those and then dried them out again and took the survivors and bred those, attempting right. to, to, to get these flies to evolve to drier conditions, but they didn't. They couldn't. And the researchers were astonished. Hmm. The article says, as other evolutionists have commented, this was a complete surprise. For creationists, this is a classic example of the built-in limits to genetic variation and therefore evidence for biblical creation. Right. Okay, how do we get there? It's because it's just like the dogs that we talked about. Right. Once they get into it, once they become adapted to a particular environment, like these flies, they became adapted over time to this rainforest, this, this hot and humid environment, right. they've lost the genetic information to survive in drier conditions, whatever right. that genetic information was. Right. So you cannot take flies from that population and expect them in a drier population to survive. They don't have the genetic information and right. they're not going to evolve it. So they've come from a source, maybe a common ancestor of these flies that have been split up. You, you, you take out the, the different um, you know, variation, the, the genetics that, okay, these ones can survive in this area, so the ones that can't, they, they drop out of the population. And then these ones go here, and they've got information to allow them to survive in, in this, you know, climate or something, and then the other information drops out. So it looks like almost maybe two different species uh, of, of, of flies, because they seem to be adapted to the same, uh, you know, different areas. But all they've done is come from a common pool of, of information right. and be d been divvied up. Of course, and the researchers, the, these evolutionary researchers realize this as well. Right. They did these same types of experiments on flies from other areas that are, that are related to, to these flies. Right. But those flies were from drier, from moderately dry areas already, not from, from super dry. Right. Uh, but th those flies had not undergone that natural selection process to become adapted to that moist environment in the rainforest. Right. So they still had the genetic information to be able to adapt to drier conditions. Right. And so these researchers, okay, well it works with these other flies, 
but these rainforest flies, let's see if they can adapt and they couldn't. So it would be the equivalent of taking a, a short-haired breed of dog, a, 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 let's say a, a, a you know, breed of dog that we've bred to have really short hair, and, and just taking those kinds of dogs, putting them in a cold environment, and seeing if you're going to get a breed of dog with long hair so that they can survive in the cold environment. Won't work. But it won't work because if they don't have the genetics to start with, they're just going to die off and they're never going to acquire the trait for long hair. That's been bred out of them. They've lost it. They can't re re right. recombine yeah. it. The original dog kind obviously had all this genetic information to adapt to all these different climates. and we, we, it's, it's the same thing with the flies. We could talk right. about dogs or yeah, flies yeah. or even people, uh, the, the different people and so on. Uh, but if we're talking about flies or dogs, the, the initial fly or, or dog or living organism yeah. had that genetic information to adapt to these changing climates. Right. See, natural selection is a wonderful process put in place by God. It's mm -hmm. brilliant engineering. Right. Imagine what would happen after the flood if, if natural selection didn't happen. After the flood, you've got the climate worldwide still settling down. I mean, you've had a worldwide flood. It's, go it's going to take several years or decades right. or, or centuries for, for, for that catastrophism to settle down. And there's going to be atmospheric effects and so on. Mm -hmm climate changing, if, if natural selection wouldn't happen, many of the animals getting off, off the ark may have become extinct, right. not able to adapt or even to more these other climates. Because some of them have gone extinct, so you would have even more. Even, even more going right. extinct, yes, right, that's right. right. Now, I remember uh, when I was growing up in school, uh, they would always use a classic example of uh, of the peppered moths. Oh yes, a a yeah. and this was proof of evolution. As a matter of fact, I remember reading in books that it was the most, um, it was their best proof for evolution because the story went that you know at a certain period in, in, in England you had these moths and there were some dark colored ones and some light colored ones and then supposedly because of the uh, uh, industrial revolution and there was a lot of pollution that these trees um, where the moths like to settle you know the, the 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 bark got a little darker because of that and so now th there were more light colored moths at first and now see they got selected out and now there was more of the darker right, colored ones surviving because they weren't camouflaged when they apparently sat on the trees during the and day the for birds, the birds to, right, to right. eat but again all we're seeing here even if that is exactly the process that that happened all we're seeing is a variation within a kind. There has been no new right. information generated because we started with dark and light colored moss, we ended with dark and light colored moss, so even if that occurred, which we would say, yeah, that, that sounds like a, a reasonable process, it's not evidence for evolution, it's just natural selection, the information was already there. Right. Right. I mean, but the, of course, the story gets even better, and you and I know this. <laughs> yes. A number of years ago, uh, that, that it was found that those moths don't even sit on trees right. during the day. That's right. They, they, were, they were glued or pinned to the trees <laughs> in the order to take the photographs. That's right. So it's, it's, uh, it, it, it gets worse and worse. Not only is it not an example of evolution, it's, it, it's kind of a poor example of natural selection anyway. It's just right. you, you, have very, you, have, you have both of these things living at the same time, right. not one becoming another over several generations. And it's just, it, okay, now there's more dark moths and less light moths. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, there's, a more, there's more light moths and less mm -hmm. dark moths. It's In the news recently, too, I, I saw there was another um, group of scientists, and they'd gone to uh, the islands where, of course, Darwin uh, had gone and and they're studying the finch beaks again of course because that was right. another example of natural selection but if, when you read, read the article carefully it just was again a, okay there's variation within a kind that you know birds have a have a, a group of uh, you know babies and yeah. some have longer beaks and some have large and some are better adapted to different different times but I mean, Darwin observed uh, different types of animals and uh, and he thought they had a common ancestor that's exactly the same thing that we would say as creationists The giraffe's heart is one of the most powerful among animals today. It needs to produce enormous pressure to get blood all the way up its long neck to its brain. This is powerful evidence for a creator because with such high blood pressure only special design features around its brain prevents it from blowing its mind when it bends down to take a drink. This is a problem for evolutionists to explain because without these special features, a giraffe bending over the first time to take a drink would die. 
but if the neck was shorter in the past, then it wouldn't need the special features. This means that the giraffe must have been designed with all of its features at once, just like the Bible says. For details, see creationontheweb.com forward slash giraffe. People are constantly being told that evolution is happening all around us, but is it really? The 60-minute DVD presentation, Dynamic Life, Changes in Living Things, deals with one of the most confusing aspects of the creation-evolution debate by focusing on a key issue. Are the changes we see in living things actually evidence of evolution? This superb presentation reveals that the examples most commonly used to support evolutionary theory are actually the opposite of evolution. Learn exactly what natural selection is and what it can actually do. What are genetic mutations? Are they a benefit to evolutionary theory? Are they ever beneficial? Find answers to these and many more of the most commonly cited examples of biological change used to promote evolution. What about insects evolving immunity to pesticides? Is that evidence for things getting better in an evolutionary sense? Does antibiotic resistance support the theory of evolution? What's the difference between adaptation and evolution? This DVD will not only show that evolution has not been observed, but will also cover the basics of the creationist model of biology. Skeptics will be amazed to find out that both natural selection and mutation fit beautifully within a biblical framework and are powerful tools to defend Genesis. This video presentation is excellent for high school level and up. Now we're talking about natural selection and animals changing over time, but the type of change that we observe has nothing to do with evolution. Right. We observe change, mm -hmm. yes, but it's change, first of all, within a kind, totally within those biblical parameters, right. and nothing new genetically, no new genetic information is being added to the genome. Right. It's, it's interesting that it's in fact impossible for animals to do anything but reproduce after their kind, exactly what it says in the Bible, because right. In order for you to do that, or in order for living things to do that, they would have to add in information, genetic right. information. Right. We, and we, you never see that. We used the, the example earlier of a, you know, a lizard turning into a bird. I mean, if you study the, the genetics of what that would, you, you, I mean, a, a lizard doesn't have information for wings. It doesn't have information for, for beaks. It doesn't have information for even, you know, some birds are migratory. Right, and that and that's a program within their within their brain to enable it to do that. Um, many many different things that a uh, a bird has that a lizard doesn't. So if at one point in time there were no such thing as birds, where did the actual DNA programming come for wings and feathers and beaks and and all those things? As an evolutionist, they need to generate that information naturalistically without God. Right, and there's no mechanism that'll do that. Right. Now, if we relate this to uh, one of the biggest questions that we get at our ministry, right. and it's, it's, it's frequently answered in Creation Magazine, there's articles every, every few years, of course, it's in the Creation Answers book. Right. Uh, how did Noah possibly fit all of these animals on board the ark? And, and I, I used to use this when I was a non-Christian, <laughs> and someone approached me about the Bible. I, you know, I don't know where I picked it up, but it, it made sense to me. And I would often ask Christians that question. Like, do you really, like, there's millions of animals all over the world. How would he possibly get it? Come on, he couldn't have done it, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, yeah. a, a lot of the, the, the skepticism stems from folks who haven't done the math. They right. haven't looked into it. And they think that creationists don't accept natural selection. Right. So then all of the millions of species that we have today, Noah would have had to take those on board the ark with him if right. creationists so, don't believe in natural selection and, and we don't have that diversity over time in the, in the living kingdom. Right. And that's what I, I used to think, too. Did, did Noah have to take two poodles and two Great Danes and two Great Pyrenees and two, you know, and, and so right. on and so forth? And then, of course, the, the problem became so staggering that I didn't even think the Bible was credible because that's the way I'd been... Had it, had it presented right. to me. So let's, let's answer the question ju just, uh, just quickly. How many animals would Noah have had to take with him on board the ark? That's right. the first thing that needs to be determined. Right. Uh, uh, John Wood Morapi, a fellow who wrote uh, um, uh, Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. Right. This, is, this is a resource for a serious, <laughs> serious inquirer because right. it answers just about every question that skeptics have thrown at the story of Noah and the flood. Right. A, a great book. And of course, one of the things he does is, well, how many animals would Noah have had to take? The right. Bible gives us some clues there, two of some, seven of others, and so on, of the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. He right. didn't need to take fish. 
and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you get to an upper limit, when you do the math, of about right. 16,000 individual animals. Right. Six, and, and that is, he's being very generous, right. giving the evolutionists all the, all the outs that they, uh, that they can. Right. So 16,000 individual animals. So two of the dog kind. Right. Like we read earlier the quote in Science Magazine where they said they've, they know that all the breeds of dogs we have today came from wolves. Yeah, they, he wouldn't have had to the take the 650-some uh, uh, right. varieties of domestic dogs. That's right. right. You take two of the dog kind. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And then you need to calculate, well, how much floor space would there be in the ark and what's the average size of all those 16,000 animals? Right. You get to an average size of about the size of a large dog, like a German shepherd dog or a right. sheep or, or something sheep, like that. Yeah. And the ark, the Bible says, had three decks. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you figure, well, how much deck space would 16,000 sheep-sized animals have taken up and you get to about a third of the floor space of the ark? Right. Yeah. Plenty of room left over for things like swimming, t swimming pool and badminton court and, 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 and whatever else. No, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Right. But right. plenty of room left over for food storage and, and whatever else they would have needed for that right. year-long time that they spent in the, in the ark. And, and uh, the book you referenced, it's, it's, a, it's a great resource because as I've picked through it, I, he, he's answered questions I never even came up with. I mean, if you're a real <laughs> skeptic on whether this could could work or not. I mean, because there are some realities. When, pe when skeptics ask questions like that, you know, I, we don't deny. I mean, if somebody brought two horses into this um, uh, studio right now, boy, you know, boy, that, that's a lot of work to care for, for two things like that. And, and of course, you got to feed them. And, and, and so, so he goes through yeah, very much detail. You know, how, how would you clean them? And how would you keep, keep care of them? How would you feed them? And right. ex like so many things he answers. But when you actually look at it, he goes, wow, yeah, that's very, very possible. You know, it's not just a fairy tale. Right. It's, it's, not, that it's, impo it's not that it's easy right. for eight people to take care of that, but he's demonstrated conclusively, I believe, right. that it's not impossible. Right. And, and it, it's very doable. Because we get people, you know, if, if you're saying, if you're going by the Bible, which is what our ministry says, Bible first approach, you know, what about dinosaurs? Because land oh, animals were... Oh, that's another topic, isn't it? It is. <laughs> but when you're talking about the ark and, and animals on the ark, I mean, we would say, well, animals were create, land animals were created on day six. Man was created on day six. Therefore, uh-oh, one of those big things that we get asked about... Dinosaurs lived with man? Right. And did they get on the ark? And look, they're so big. And, <laughs> you know, uh, I think every time someone finds a, a scrap of bone in the ground, you know, they, they want to, you know, it's a dinosaur. They want to get their name called after, you know. So if I found that, I'd be a, it'd be a Calvinsaurus or something like we, that. We need to do a show on dinosaurs. And yep. one of the upcoming weeks, we're, we're going to do that. We right. have to do that. Such yeah. a big topic. Now, the... the the dangerous, I believe, part in, in the, the, that this natural selection plays in the public eye is what's happening in public school systems. Right. Because in the public school system, what teachers are saying, and, and some of them don't know any better, they're just teaching out of the textbook, right. is students, look at these little changes in living things mm -hmm. that we observe. That's proof and, of evolution. And, and, and we do. We, we observe that. We have no problem with, right. these, with these little changes. But then it's kind of a bait and switch. Look at these things over here. And imagine if we had millions of years, right. those little changes that we observe could add into the big changes that evolve one kind of an animal right. to another, but it can't happen. And yet students are given, uh, they're, they're given a process, natural selection, yep. for which there's a lot of evidence, right. and then there's this extrapolation, unwarranted extrapolation made that if we had millions of years, you could get evolution. Right, but you because can't. If, if natural selection was providing even a little bit of new information, when it happened, then you could say, okay, well, given millions of years. But natural yeah. selection tends to eliminate information. As you were saying earlier, a poodle has less information than a wolf. And, 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 and if we didn't you know, take care <laughs> of the poodle, it would be naturally selected out of the population. It, it would be unselected <laughs> if, if, <laughs> right. if you put them out in the wild, wouldn't That's it? That's right. Yeah. So it's really not fair for, um, for an evolutionist to use natural selection as a real mechanism for, for the grand theory of evolution. It fits the creation model. Right. Because you're, you're, you're seeing less and less information over time. We live in a sin right. cursed world. We'd expect that anyway. Yeah. And, and you're seeing that information being diversified and specialized in the living things. Right. But no new information is added. And so you, you certainly wouldn't uh, hear an evolutionist say, oh, I believe in creation because of natural selection. And yet we agree with natural selection and we say that's not evidence for evolution. Right. right. So, you know, I always try to bring people back to, you know, this isn't just a scientific 
argument. This isn't just something for us to talk about. Um, this has real consequences. You know, most people are familiar with the Columbine school massacre uh, that occurred, uh, I think it was 1998, and uh, 1999 actually. And, you know, there were some diaries left by some of the, the perpetrators that, you know, took part in, in, in this. And this is where a group of kids came and in, went into a school and just started shooting people and, and stuff. And one of the, the diaries contained this comment. It said, sometime in April, me and V, it was a, somebody, a friend he was referring to. Nickname. We'll, yeah, we'll get revenge and we'll kick natural selection up a few notches. I mean, this person obviously, you know, probably believed in... Darwinian evolution, that it was survival of the fittest, and natural selection is all often equated with survival of the fittest. And, and here's someone taking their worldview and putting it into action, so to speak, with, with right. very bad consequences. He's using a biological principle mm -hmm. rather than the Bible right. for, his, for their moral code. It's and I mean, if you look at, uh, here's, a, here's a quote I use a lot. This is William Provine, and he's a professor of biological sciences. So it's, it's biology that he's an expert in, right. but look at his worldview because of it. He says, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us. Um, there are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. So what you believe about where you came from dramatically affects your whole worldview. And we've been saying this on this program. That's, what our, uh, that's one of the things that our ministry makes clear, the science and the moral aspects of what you believe about where you came from. Since Eve was formed out of a rib from Adam, some Christians have grown up believing that men have one less rib than women, which they don't. Some anti-creationists have used this to mock Genesis. But today, if someone loses their hand, it doesn't mean that their children will be born without hands. Interestingly, ribs are one of the few bones in the body that can grow back if removed, as long as the periosteum, the tissue around the bone, is left intact. So even Adam would have had the same number of ribs as everyone else. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creationist publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man, or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend, the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors' email feedback. Often, the anti-creationist arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. We get a lot of feedback from folks all over the world. Uh, they, they write emails into our, uh, our website. And, uh, and we answer those. Our scientists uh, generally answer some of those articles. If, they're not already con if the answer already isn't contained in the 4,000 and, and more and growing articles that are on the website, right. uh, there will be a response. Usually on Friday. Friday is the, yeah. is the Feedback Friday, as we call them, which is where we take a, a letter, some feedback from someone who's written in, and, and our scientists go through it and explain it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the feedbacks that came in, is just, I, I just found this interesting, uh, he wrote a very, very technical question, and it was answered by one of our scientists. We're not going to do that here. Right. Um, but he said that 
as a result, of, there, there was an interesting piece on the complexity of genes, and as much as I hate to admit it, this is a Christian fellow, right. my faith is wavering due to this. So he saw something uh, from an evolutionary perspective right. on the complexity of genes, and it caused his faith to waver. And I just, I think of my own story, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, and when I started exploring this issue, reading the books and so on, right. at first I was what you'd call an evidentialist. Right. right. The, the was evidence getting, was important to you. The evidence was important, yeah. and, and it is, yeah. but it needs to be properly understood. I wasn't there yet. Right. I was just going with evidence. Look at all, all this evidence for creation, and here's this evidence and this evidence, and evidence in geology and biology and yeah, so yeah. on. And then I'd watch an evolutionary program on television, and I'd see their evidence right. explained from an evolutionary perspective. I didn't realize that that's what they were doing. Right. You just took it as a fact. I just took it as a fact, and I, and I got scared. And I thought, oh, oh man. Is Christianity not right? Maybe it's wrong. Maybe I'm being right. led down the garden path here. And, and Because, let's face it, people are interested in the evidence. And, and maybe if they've never been taught that there are presuppositions behind the facts. I mean, one of the most popular TV shows out there right now is called CSI. You know, a, right. and crime yep. scene investigation. And, and, of course, you know, people are into that sleuthing. And let's examine the clues and use scientific methods to examine the clues and, and you know I think the taglines uh, you know follow the evidence because it never lies but that's not right. true there's there's facts you know uh, if, if this is a, a fossil fish in a rock that's the fact but how it got there that's an interpretation. You have to make up a story to explain right. something that happened in the past. And you can use scientific methods to do that but it's it's you know as a Christian this fellow here, he says, my faith is wavering due to this. Well, we know that happens a lot. That's why our ministry exists. It's a dangerous position to be in, to, right. to be to, to, you know, flung to and fro by every wind of evidence, if, if, you know, if we paraphrase well, Ephesians there. Ephesians 4.14 says that you know, you're like forever wandering around looking to, you know, people are telling you clever lies and you're changing your mind about what you believe. That's a tough position to be in because then you can't go to the Bible. You can't just open scripture, and, and God's got a lot of promises in there, and, and you know you can't just read it plainly and go, wow, you know, and have confidence in, in the God of the Bible. So understanding these things that we observe in the fossil record, in the rocks, in biology, and so on, we need to understand that it's from a pre we need to think from a, an axiomatic or a presuppositional approach. Right. It's all about the faith position that we have about the past. Either God's word is true, mm -hmm. that God created and there was a global flood, or yeah. millions of years of history. Because the evolutionists that you know, the strong evolution someone like Richard Dawkins or, or someone like that, you know, there are serious challenges to the, series, uh, to the theory of evolution, but they don't change their position just because there's a, 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 right. a little piece of evidence that somehow contradicts. Of course, there's a lot of evidence that contradicts their theories, but they don't, you know, they're not going to throw out their faith position simply because of that, and neither should a Christian, <laughs> even more so That's right. a Christian. There's another article that was, uh, or another feedback that came in. Why wouldn't God use evolution? We get this and we've, we've dealt with this uh, already in the past couple of programs. Uh, the, this is from someone in the USA. Right. He writes, evolution is not evil. In fact, my question is, why wouldn't God use evolution? And, and at the end, he says, there's no reason why God would not do it this way. It makes absolute sense. Well, um, you know, we, we hear that a lot, of course. We hear that, you know, why wouldn't God use evolution? And, um, you know, there's a quote from a, a man named Jacques Minot, and he was, a, he was an atheist, he was an evolutionist, and uh, he did a lot of work in genetics and stuff. And he was actually in an interview situation one time, and the interviewer was of the same opinion as this fellow. He, he believed in God, but he believed God had used so he evolution. Was, he was a theistic evolutionist. Theistic evolutionist. He believed in evolution, but he also believed in God, a theistic evolutionist. That's right. Yeah. And he asked Jacques Minot the same question. Of course, Minot was, a, was an evolutionary atheist. And um, he, he said this to him. He said, you know, one could conceive of God using randomness, mutations, natural selection, okay. uh, evolutionary uh, methods, just so long as there was a pattern which he was imposing upon the results of the chance mutations, which is a little bit <laughs> contradictory. You've yeah. you got, you know, uh, anyway. And Mano uh, answered him. He was polite. He said, well, if you want to assume that, I've no dispute with it, except one, which is not a scientific dispute, but a moral one. The evolutionist knew the moral implication. He said, namely, selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. And the interviewer said, cruel? 
And Mano said, well, yeah, because the more cruel, because it's a pr process of elimination, of destruction. The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society, in w one in which the weak is protected. And he said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. So here's an atheist who recognizes that you can't have evolution the way it's talked about in Christianity. Right. Lots more in upcoming programs. Come back next week and what are we going to talk about? Mutations next week.